Thank you, Clayton and Lauren, for leading us into the Lord's presence in a beautiful way. I know some of you would just like to linger there the whole day in that, in that presence of worship. But the Lord wants to speak to us this morning through His Word. You know, as the world takes this one day today to celebrate love, as believers, we take a lifetime to celebrate the love of the Father. Isn't it nice to know that the Father's love is not limited to the 14th of February every year? There is no limit to the love of the Father. The love of the Father is streaming towards you. And I pray this morning as we go through this message that the truth of that word will settle in your heart once and for all. For each and every day, we as God's people are vibrantly aware of the divine love of God. The one who came down, who left his divine place, that place for of perfection, that place where everything he would ever need or want is there, where there is no sin, sickness, tears, where there is nothing negative. Our Jesus, he left that place. Can you imagine doing that? Leaving a place of perfection to take on the form of a human, to come down to the sinful world and to suffer. When you had all of that, that is the love of our God. And that love needs to resonate within our hearts. Now, there are two scriptures in the Bible which are more known than any other scripture. The one, of course, is Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And the other one is John 3.16, for God so loved the world. And these two scriptures describe this God so beautifully. He, it describes God as the great shepherd who cares and nurtures and protects his lambs. That is on the one side. But it also describes the everlasting father who loves and disciplines and directs his children. What more could a spiritually alive person ask for than to be watched over by the great shepherd the eternal heavenly father but how we experience God's love is going to be determined by our heart to him and our relationship with him now some people have quite a shallow relationship with God where they think that God is there to do their bidding. And if He doesn't do what they say, they're going to be upset with Him. And they're going to draw away from Him. That is the relationship some people have. Other people have a relationship with God where they connect with Him when they need something. But they kind of forget about Him when everything's going okay. They don't actually turn their backs on Him. But neither do they truly turn their faces towards Him. Whilst others recognize that this God is their heavenly Father who cares deeply about them. Even when things are going tough. They recognize that at, at times God corrects us. At times He's there protecting us. There's different stages in our walk with the Lord. But they know that God is good. And they know that God knows what is best for them. And you might be going through a tough time. And you might not be understanding why you're going through it. But if you can know your God. And you can know that if God is allowing this, He obviously has a purpose. Let me just walk in it. Let me walk in it so I can walk through it and have the victory. Because God always leads us into victory. He never leads us to a place of disaster. So whatever you are going through, you need to know your God is with you. 
And there's many stories in the Bible that you can read. And at the time, the people were not aware of the outcome. The outcome was still ahead of them. There were certain times of, of disaster that they were living in. Like we read with Queen Esther recently in our daily readings. And I really want to encourage you, church, to follow those readings. I'm just giving you one chapter a day, which is easy to, to be able to fit into your schedule somewhere. And then to give you a little bit of background or a little bit of enlightenment on it so that it can make it alive. I want God's Word to be alive to you. So when you read it, it is meaningful. And it's not just a... Some people think the Bible is just a history book. It's not. It is the living God speaking to you. And He wants it to be alive to you. So please, I'm, I'm really earnestly asking that you, that you go on this journey that we are on. But when you... When you truly get to understand that your God is on your side, that your God is for you, then you can understand scriptures like Romans 8.28, which says, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. But no matter what you're going through, you know God will cause that thing to turn around. He will bring something good no matter how bad it is. Now, I've told you before, many, many years ago, early on in my working days, before I actually had a career, I was working, and I got retrenched. Some of you know the, the um, circumstances surrounding that with military service and everything that was happening in those days. And I lost my job. And as I've said before, I, I remember I, I was living at home with my parents at the time. And I remember my mom, who, who was a beautiful, godly, spiritual woman. And she said to me, John, just trust God. He will turn this around. He will have something in this for you. Just trust in God. And without giving you all the details, me losing that job opened up a corporate career for me. Now at the time, I could not see what was ahead. All I could see was the disaster of the day. And some of you, all you are seeing is the disaster of the day. What is going wrong? And what you should be doing is getting on your knees and saying, God, I just hand it to you because you have promised that you will turn this around and cause it for my good. I am resting in that. Do you rest in the promises of God? Or do you allow the disaster of the day to destroy you on the inside? What about Proverbs 3? We've just finished the book of Proverbs recently. We read that, what, in January, hey? Eh? Yeah, we read Proverbs in January. So on January 3rd, you would have read this verse. It says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. Now you might say, well, I don't like correction. If you know your God, you will embrace correction because it means God loves you. God hasn't turned away from you. He hasn't forgotten about you. He is there correcting you. It is proof of God's love for you. When you can understand who God is, and then it helps you to embrace His Word. And when you are embracing His Word, you have the peace of life. Because no matter what you're going through, you know your God has got your back. Your God is going before you. And He's causing all things to work together for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. What kind of a relationship do you have with God? Is it a shallow one like I described where the God of the universe, the God of all creation... You see as your personal genie, 
just there to click your fingers and he must do what you want him to do. Otherwise, pass off. Sorry, Lord, that was just for demonstration. Or is it one where you only connect with him when you need something or when something goes wrong? Or do you have an actual relationship with him which he is seeking to enjoy with you? Do you know your God wants a relationship with you? That is his desire. That is his heart's desire. That's why he created you, to have that relationship. He didn't just create you to say, oh, well, let's see how this one suffers. No, he, he created you to say, I want them to turn to me. I want them to rely on me. I want them to draw from me. I want them to allow me to live through them. Because that is what this whole life on earth is about. It is God living through you. That's why God came to earth. He wanted to show the way. And our relationship with God will determine our love towards Him and how we understand His love towards us. Your relationship with God is going to determine how you love Him and how you receive love from Him. Now, I know there's many people that go through life and they feel unworthy. And they, they can't receive the love of God because the whole time the enemy is telling them they are unworthy. As if the person next to you or behind you is in front of you is more worthy than you. No, we are all equally unworthy. That is the beauty of God's system. You don't have to compare yourself to somebody else because the somebody else is also unworthy. All you have to do is look into the eyes of the loving God and His love will melt away all of that stuff because He doesn't see unworthiness. He sees Jesus Christ. He sees you washed in the blood of the Lamb. He doesn't see your unworthiness. He sees you and He's saying, Stand up. Stand up, daughter. Stand up, son. Come. Embrace me. Love me. Receive from me. Receive from me because you have been justified. What does it mean, justified? Just as if I had never sinned. That's justification. Just if I'd never sinned. That's how God sees you. When we can start understanding that concept, we can come into the throne room with open arms and we can run like a two-year-old into her daddy's arms because that two-year-old doesn't know any shame. That two-year-old doesn't know any unworthiness. All she knows is the love of her daddy. That's what God wants for you. He wants you to be able to run into him like that and just to embrace him. Unless you become like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Because then you're getting so complicated in your brain and you're trying to work things out. And the Bible says, do not lean on your own understanding. Just trust in the Lord with all your heart. This is a time to trust in the Lord, folks. Not to try and work things out in your head. Allow the Holy Spirit to work those things out in your heart. But you need to put God's word into your heart so the Holy Spirit can work it out in your heart. God loves you. Do you know that? Human love is fickle. Human love is conditional. If you do this, then I will do that. A little bit like a, a contract uh, if you were to sign at a company. You supply a million vaccines and I will give you so many million rands. That is a conditional love kind of or conditional relationship. If I don't feel love, then I'm not going to love back. That is the human kind of love. It's based on what I'm getting. It's a selfish love. You can just see the pitfalls with that, can't you? You can imagine the expiry date stamped onto that. Because in life, you will not always feel loved even from that one who is closest to you. There may be times where you don't experience that as love. But God's love is different. God's love is covenantal, which means that God loves you no matter what you do. That is mind-boggling 
to the human brain. Because that's not how we function. But we serve a covenantal God who loves us with an everlasting love. Now, some people misinterpret that to mean that it doesn't matter how they treat him because through his character, he is forced to love them back regardless. You've got to be careful how you understand this. It's partly true. What they fail to recognize is that just because God loves you, it doesn't mean you're going to get what you want. It doesn't always mean you get your way. Okay? Our love to God needs to be so entrenched in who he is that whatever he has for us, we embrace it. Because some people tie up with what God is giving them to God loving them. So they have asked for a, let me just choose a stupid thing, a new pair of shoes. And that new pair of shoes didn't come on day one, so therefore God doesn't love them. That's how some people interpret it. You know, I I mentioned one of the most well-known scriptures at the start of this service, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. According to this passage, who does God love? For God loved the world. He so loved the world. God loves every single person on earth. Are all who are loved going to be saved? I want you to catch this. Are everybody who is loved by God going to be saved? No. Despite God's love for the world, many will not be saved. Many will end in hell. But that is not what God wanted. There needs to be a personal response to God's love. That is why it is so important for us as God's people to understand the love of God so that we can respond to it. A response which is in line with His word and in line with His requirements. Because thinking that an unrepentant life is safe just because God tells you He loves you, it lacks wisdom and understanding. His requirements still stand. But what a comfort it is to know that when we turn to Him and with a repentant heart, the power of heaven draws alongside us to assist us to get aligned with God. You see, God will always help you to achieve that which He wants you to do. No matter how crazy the idea is that He tells you, when you do what God wants you to do, He empowers you to do it because you are doing the will of God. God wants your life to be in line with Him. Is it hard? Well, if you are, if, let's say you've been addicted to heroin for five years. You know, they, the statistics tell me there's a, like a 2% recovery rate from heroin. But I can tell you something else. There's a 100% recovery rate when you align with God and you start seeking God's will for your life. Because there is nothing that can stop you from achieving that which God tells you. What God gives you to do, there is all the power of heaven. And when you have the power of heaven, there's nothing on earth that can stop you. Not even if if the enemy unleashes every single demonic presence upon you. It cannot overcome the power of heaven. Our task is to align with what God wants. What does God want? This morning, God wants you to know that He loves you. That He loves you. That he loves you with an unconditional love. That means that even if you mess up along the way, he doesn't stop loving you. It is the Lamb of God who gave his life for the sin of the world. The Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world, as we heard last week from from John It was Jesus who came to display the love of God to mankind. Jesus, Son of God, came down from heaven, came down to earth, taking on a fleshly body in order to become the perfect, spotless sacrifice for mankind. Why? Because of His immense love for us. For God so loved the world that He gave. Have you noticed that? Out of love you want to give? Giving is part of love. If you love somebody, you want to give. You want to... It's a way of showing your love. 
A God who loves us with an everlasting love, according to the prophet Jeremiah. An everlasting love, a love which never, ever, ever, ever comes to an end. This is the love one would only dream of outside of God. But in Christ Jesus, it is ours. And He's living inside of us today. The God of love is living inside of us. More than any other people group on earth, we as God's people should be able to out-love anybody else. The first epistle of John tells us that God is love. It doesn't say that God is loving or that He has love. It says God is love, which in my mind tells me that you can't have true love outside of God because God is love. That's where love is found, in God. And that God is living inside of us. It needs to impact the way we love. We should be the most loving people on earth. Having the God of love living within us. What a blessed people we are. When you think of love, many people would uh, immediately think of maybe a beautiful wedding that they went to. A wedding that they experienced. Possibly it was your own wedding that was just so beautiful that whenever you hear the word love, you, you align it with that experience. And obviously as pastors, we get the privilege to attend many different weddings. And each one is special in its own way. Because each one has got special people involved who love one another. And when, often when we conduct a, a wedding, we use the passage that from the Apostle Paul he gave us in 1 Corinthians 13, which says, Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It is not boastful, proud, or rude. Love isn't selfish or quick-tempered. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs that others do. Love rejoices in the truth, not in evil. Love is always supportive. Loyal, hopeful, and trusting. Love never fails. And this is God's definition of love given to us in the Bible. And whenever I, I pronounce that, that love definition that God has given us, I always think if love is patient and love is kind, am I patient with those I love? Am I kind? Because this is God's definition. Are you being patient with your spouse? Are you being kind with your spouse? Because if you say you love them, and you have the God of love living within you, you need to be patient, you need to be kind, you need to be all of these things. I don't see much patience outside of God, and it sure needs a godly mindset to not be selfish or quick-tempered. And heavenly described love can only be achieved through the presence of God, the God of love living within us. And we get to have that. Isn't it awesome? And this godly kind of love should bring us to a place in life. It shouldn't just be something that we take for granted. It should bring us somewhere. And I've put down three places which I feel the Holy Spirit led to share with you this morning. The first place that godly love should bring us to is the foot of the cross. When we recognize how much God loves us and what He did for us, we should come to that place at the foot of the cross, a place of gratitude, a place of thankfulness, a place that every time we share in communion together, we are remembering that which He has done. That is the first place that this love needs to bring us to, the foot of the cross. If we have missed that, then anything else is virtually meaningless. If you haven't come to the foot of the cross and said, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me for my rebellion, for my sin. I want to be your child. And we know that all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We read that 
I think it was two days ago when we started the book of Joel. All who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But we need to come to that place of recognizing that this is the God of love and He loves me. He loves me so much that He died for me. Have you got that? He died for you personally. Not just the world, each one of us personally. But there's a second place that this love within us should bring us to. And that is to a place of forgiveness and restoration in relationships. You see, if the love of God is living within me, I need to be able to be able to restore things where things go wrong, where you trip up over one another. The love of God which is living inside of me is the power to restore, to be able to say, forgive me, I did wrong. And then for the other person to be able to receive that repentant heart and to be able to pronounce, I forgive you. It's hurting, but I forgive you. This is the second place where this love that is inside of us needs to bring us to. To one of restitution in relationships. To be able to take arms with one another and say, well, let's move on and let's achieve that which God has set aside for us. So the love needs to bring us to the foot of the cross so that we can... We, we can recognize that where this love comes from and the price that, it was, that was paid for us to have that love. But then it needs to be lived out in our relationships. We know when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he says, the greatest commandment is that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And the second is like it, shall love your neighbor as yourself. You see, this love needs to work Two ways. It needs to work upwards and it needs to work horizontally as well. It's not God's will for people to be living in distress, for people to be living in tension, for races to be against one another. There is only one race on earth. It is the human race. Different people have different languages. They have different customs. But there is only one race. And the enemy comes and he wants to use differences to separate. Say, ah, different races. You're different. You need, to, you need to argue. You need to be at loggerheads. God says, no, there is one race. You need to love one another. Can you imagine if every person on earth embraced God's word and started to live it out? What this world would be like. There is coming a time when, when Jesus is going to reign on earth, where he's going to come down to earth and reign on earth for a thousand years, according to the book of Revelation. And we will be living in such a time when people are honoring God, when things are working out. And then there's a third place which we should get to through this love. And that third place is, is one where we are looking outward to share that love that we have received. So the second one was in the forgiveness and restoration. But the third place that we need to get to is where that love is flowing out of us. Freely you have received. Freely you need to give. And anyone living outside of this relationship with God is only doing so out of ignorance or out of rebellion. Because God has made it possible for every single person on earth to enjoy such a relationship with Him. In 2 Peter 3, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. What promise is that? His, the promise of His return. The Bible says that people will mock. In the end times, they will mock. They will say, oh, Jesus says He's coming back and He hasn't come back yet. When that trumpet blows, their mockery will turn to crying and weeping and wailing. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is the heart of God, that all should come to repentance. Jesus is giving time, or the Father is giving time before sending the Son, he is giving time for people to come to repentance. But there is coming a time when he will say, Son, it's time to go fetch your bride. 
And with the shout of an archangel and the blowing of the trumpet, Jesus will appear in the sky. And those who have made Him their Lord and Savior, those who have received this love offering from above, they will be taken up to be with Him. You need to see the beautiful heart of God in all its purity. He is long-suffering towards us, not will, willing that any should perish. He's giving everyone a chance. But of course, the majority are not interested. They are just mocking him. Remember Jesus spoke to Peter after Peter had denied him three times. Jesus restored him by asking him three questions. Peter, do you love me? But he asked him three questions in three slightly different ways. I want to ask you three questions this morning. The first one is, do you know that God is affectionate towards you? You need to accept it. Do you know that God is embracing you? You need to receive His embrace for yourself. And thirdly, do you know that God loves you? You need to believe it in a way which warms your heart. And changes the way you think. Do you know that God is affectionate towards you? Do you know that God is embracing you? Do you know that God loves you? And I'm saying you personally, do you know it? Not that God loves the church or God loves people. Yes, we know that. But do you know that God loves you? You need to know it. It's our job, our job. To help people hear this message of love and to understand it's for them too. This is the, the ministry of the body. And you might be thinking, no, 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 that's the pastor's job. No, my job is to equip you. Your job is to impact the world. It's your job to connect with that person Wherever, be it at work, be it at the shops, be it wherever. It might be a family member. They need to know that God loves them the same way He loves you. Make it your life mission, even if you just choose one person. Make it your life mission that that one person, I'm saying one, I'm not limited to one, I'm just saying at least one. That that one person will understand the love of God before you die. Because as you start sharing the love of God, the love of God will become more real to you. When you start telling somebody, then God questions you as well. Saying, oh, do you actually believe that that you're saying? And then you have to answer God. Yes, Lord, or actually, Lord, I'm battling in this area. But I know you want this person to understand it. So work with me as well. But this is the ministry of the saints, to show the love of God. All too often in the world, we want to show the sin and we want to say how bad people are. But what about the love of God? We have the good news or gospel, not the bad news. We haven't got the Shambok news. We've got the love of God news, that God loves the people. He even, God loves us just the way we are, no matter how bad we are. But I like to add to that and say he loves us so much that he doesn't want to leave us where we are. He wants to take us to a better place in him. So it's our job to help people hear this message of love, that God loves them. To help them to understand it, to help them to function with it, to help break down the barriers within them so that they start to receive it for themselves. This is our purpose here on earth. That's why it's so important that we understand it. Because it's very difficult to convince somebody else when we're not convinced ourselves. So are you convinced that God loves you? You need to be convinced. You need to know it beyond any shadow of a doubt. Your sin is not greater than God's love. When you come to God and say, Lord, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter. Wesley and I were talking the other day. And it doesn't make sense that if Hitler on his deathbed said in German... I almost said, but 
But that wouldn't be in German. Well, that's, that's probably the closest I can come to. Um, but if he, even if Hitler or Stalin or any of those people on their deathbed, five, five minutes before they died, said, Lord, I've made a mistake. Forgive me. They will be forgiven. Now, we would have a scale. And we would have six million Jews who died, terrible death, and God's love. And we would say, no, 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 no. He deserves hell. But what if we were on the scale? If my sin was on that scale, is it any less worse? I haven't killed people, but a break in the chain is a broken chain. We always want to weigh up, this is worse than this, and this is worse. But either you have sinned or you haven't sinned. And the Bible tells me that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We, not one of us, deserve it. That is what I want you to catch. Don't allow the enemy to make you feel unworthy because nobody is worthy. The enemy uses part truths. He comes to you and says, you're not worthy. And you look at your life and you say, he's right. I'm not worthy. I remember this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And, this. and Jesus says, yes, but my blood has paid for that. Stop looking at your sin and start looking at me. Start receiving from me. Start listening to the Spirit. Listen to the Word of God. Not your head. Not the voices coming in your ear. There's only one voice. It's the voice of the shepherd. You need to know his voice. He will lead you. Not, don't listen to the enemy's voice. The enemy likes to sit on your shoulder and, and he tries to control you. You know, like, a, like you see a kingdom and you've got a king sitting on his throne. But it's actually the, the queen that turns the head. Yeah, that's, that's a bit like the enemy sitting on our shoulder. He wants to take your head and turn your head and say, hey, get off. Get off and get out. I'm not listening to you. I listen this way only. We need to grasp this important truth that God loves me, me personally. We bring the gospel of hope, the good news to the nations. Let us stop tainting the good news with our doubting and help others to see the love of God for themselves. Because at the end of the day, that is all that counts. That's my message for you today. Have you received it? Let's stop doubting, folks. Let's start becoming believing believers in Jesus' name. So, Heavenly Father, once again, as we draw this service to a close, Lord, I lift up your sons and your daughters and have spoken into their hearts today. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you continue to work this message so that those seeds can develop into, into saplings and eventually, Lord, to grow into trees, tall, mighty trees that will be able to withstand the storms of life and all the blowing of the wind will not change them because they know the truth and the truth has set them free. Would you continue to weave this message into the fiber of our DNA, Lord, that it will become part of who we are. So I speak your blessing upon them. I ask, Lord, for your protection. I thank you for that ring of fire that we've, that vision that you gave Clayton and, and which Lawrence sang about. Lord, I thank you for that ring of fire. You are hedging us in. And I say thank you, Lord, that you are hedging this people in. I ask, Lord, that you just continue to pour out that anointing of healing and blessing upon their heads. I lift up those, Lord, who have lost their jobs or those who have had such severe salary cuts, Lord, that they can't even survive. And I speak your blessing. I speak, Lord, an escalation of that which you are doing as far as employment is concerned. We know there's virtually no jobs available. But Lord, that is not our concern. You are our provider. Therefore, you can pick that one in a million out and give it to your children. Lord, I speak that into being. I speak, Lord, provision into the lives of your children. And health and healing in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you.
The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Be blessed.